do this yesterday. So we are going to, in your packet, find your packet for me, packet for me. Uh, we are in the next page over. So it looks like this has a little concept map on it. We're just going to refresh what we did yesterday very, very quickly. So remember yesterday we talked about how there were two uh, main branches of matter. There were some, you know what I need to do? I need to share my screen or else that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. There you guys go. All right. So um, we had two, thank you, two main pieces of matter. Okay, the two things are there were substances with fixed ratio of elements. That means one, all of the same thing, or it had uh, two or more, but chemically joined together. And then we had things that were put together, but not chemically joined. Does anybody remember either of those terms talking about matter? We said one of these was a mixture. Is the first one or the second one, do you think that they're going to be a mixture? Perfect. Thank you. The second one. So mixtures are substances that are together, but not chemically joined. And then the substances with fixed ratio of elements, those are pure substances. Okay. Awesome. Then out of our pure substances, we had elements and compounds. Which do you think has a single kind of atom in it? An element or a compound is a building block of matter, single kind. Very good. That is element. And then when you have two or more things that are chemically joined together, that is a compound. Very good. Okay. Then we have two different types of mixtures. Uniform means an even distribution. It looks all the same, if you will. And non-uniform means you can see the parts, non-uniform. Okay. So if you want to add that little addition there. Remember, we had homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homo means the same. So if it has a uniform or you can't see any pieces of parts, like my copper sulfate here, this looks all blue. It is a mixture. There's water and copper sulfate in here. But you can't see the different pieces and parts. It's a homogeneous mixture. And then a heterogeneous mixture would be one where you can see the pieces and parts. Okay. So what we're going to do right now is we are going to give <laughs> my students that were in here yesterday, I forgot to make you do the lecture questions um, at the bottom. So if you would like to fire up your computer, there's kind of two different ways you can get to it. Oh, well, I guess it went away for yesterday. No, there's one way to get to it. Go into week seven. Go into week seven. And in week seven, you're going to go into Monday, because this was yesterday's stuff that we just went over. Here is the little recording of yesterday's class if you were at home and you didn't get to see it. And I want everybody in here right now to do the three matter lecture, question, lecture questions from yesterday because I neglected. I remembered in all of my other classes except for this one. I apologize. And if you are waiting at home, start to go ahead on this worksheet here because that's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to finish the rest of this worksheet. But I want everybody in here, week seven, Monday's folder. This is a refresher of yesterday's stuff. See if you can't do lecture questions number one. Once you're done with that, turn your attention back to this worksheet because we are going to do this worksheet because I just wrote the quiz. Um, and there are a couple of these pictures that we'll need to make sure that everybody knows how to do um, and identify them. But we could do this together a little bit. So I'm going to walk around, make sure he's doing matter lecture questions from yesterday, number one. And then we'll end up doing number two by the end of the period. But we have to take a few notes first. Okay. Coming around to see how confusing I made it for everybody and taking some attendance. All 
Walmart. Yeah, we got you. We got you. We got you. We got you. You. And is Rachel here? Yeah. Good. And then who do I got here? So if you are finishing your lecture questions, All right. Yeah, we're doing our lecture questions from yesterday. And then we're going to take perfect, done, perfect, perfect. I can get you started once you do those lecture questions. I can get you started on this worksheet if you'd like. Once I see pretty much everybody feeling good on those lecture questions, we'll at least do the front. We can save the back for the end of the period. All right. All right. So let's turn your attention back to the worksheet here. So we are going to just break these down into pure substances. And remember, pure substances are elements or compounds. Okay, but it has to be, and I heard it described yesterday, which was really good. If you reach into that box and every single thing that you pull out is exactly the same, okay? That means it's a pure substance. So let's take a look at number one. Do you think that number one is a pure substance or a mixture? Is it representing a pure substance or a mixture? Mixture, very good. So we can take this away from number one, not a pure substance. Now, remember, heterogeneous means you can see the parts and homogeneous means it's even. Now, this one's kind of tough because you would have to imagine if you were zoomed out and there seems to be like a layer. So this might be oil on top of water. But is there an even distinction where there's a layer of this stuff and a layer of that stuff? Yes. So if you can see the two layers, which of these do you think it's going to be if you can see the parts? A heterogeneous mixture. Okay. Drawing number two. Do you think that's a pure substance or a mixture? Pure substance. Very good. Number two, pure substance. Again, remember, a pure substance is if you reach in and every single thing you pull out is exactly the same. So in drawing number three, is that a pure substance or a mixture? That's going to be actually be a pure substance. That one is super tricky. So you can look for something like that on the quiz. That's because every single one, this would be like a compound. This is one, a circle with a block, a circle with a block, a circle with a block, a circle with a block. Every single thing I pull out of there is exactly the same. Okay, that one was meant to be tricky. Talk to so me. So if there was a circle in the block, would it be a mixture then? Yeah, if like, let, let's say I had over here. So they're going to have to be connected. Uh -huh. Let's say if I just had some random circles and a couple uh -huh. blocks without it. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? That would be a mixture. Very good question. All right, drawing number four. Is everything you pull out exactly the same? No, that makes it a mixture. Ex again, so these are going to be very iffy. I could take either one of these as an answer depending on how you see it. If you're like, look, you can see the different pieces and parts. So that's heterogeneous. I get it. Or if you're like, hey, it's pretty evenly dispersed. I would call it homogeneous. You just would need to give me an explanation. So you have to know it's a mixture. And as long as you can support yourself, you'll be fine on the quiz. All right. Oh, I'm in the wrong. We were talking about that for there. All right. For the last one, 
Is every single thing that I pull out exactly the same? No, so that means it's a mixture. I think these are pretty evenly spaced out, so I'm gonna call that one homogeneous, okay? And you can have more practice of this on the back once we're done, because I know these are challenging. So, do you think in the box, they have elements, compounds, are both in the first box? Like they're just a circle and just a square. They're not attached to anything. Those are gonna be representative of elements. Very good. In box number two, do you see elements or compounds or both? Elements. Very good, very good. Drawing number three, elements, compounds, or both? Perfect, because they are touching, they are chemically joined together, these are compounds. Drawing number four, elements or compounds or both? Both, good job. We have compounds here and we have a single element right there. Very good. And then in drawing number five, elements, compounds, or both? Elements, they're singletons by themselves. Okay, so I just wanted to refresh that with you because that is a challenge. There is another part to this worksheet, but what, oh, never mind, come on here, just can move on. Let's go to the next page here. It looks like this. We are actually going to save this first part. We're going to do this tomorrow on Wednesday. So we're going to go down and we're going to just get into a few notes here. I'm going to make sure that I give you time to do your post lab or your post lecture questions um, this time today. My apologies about yesterday. Okay. Now, Again, depending on how your physical science career has gone, this might be super simple to you. You're like, I know all of this. Or you might be saying, this is a new or this is a refresher. I do know we have six terms we're going to go over. I guarantee you, you don't know the last two. So if you're like starting to zone out on me because you're like, I know this stuff. The last two are chemistry specific terms. So let's get into that. We're going to talk about physical and chemical properties today. Okay. Physical and chemical properties. So you've probably heard about this. A physical property can be measured without changing the chemical composition of a substance. A physical property can be measured without changing the chemical composition of a substance. Okay. Awesome. So some examples of physical properties, because I just told you I just wrote the quiz. So I'm going to say, is this a chemical or a physical property? You'll have to tell me some examples you want to jot down. Density. That was a huge one that we talked about. Because can you measure mass and volume without changing it? Absolutely. You take the volume and you put it on a scale, take the mass. That's easy. Another one could be color. Odor, anything that you're picking up with your senses are physical properties. Shape or size of matter. And another really big one that we want to talk about is solubility. And I want to take a second to talk about what solubility is. Because I'm going to assume that you guys know what solubility is because that is something you kind of got to know coming into chemistry. The other way to say solubility is uh, um, if something is soluble, salt is soluble in water. What does soluble mean? This salt is going to do what in this water? Dissolve. It's going to dissolve. So if I pour some in here, okay, and I stir it, what does dissolving mean to you? How can you explain what this is doing? It's disappearing. It's going away. It's going into the water. Either way. It is called soluble if it does dissolve, and it's called insoluble. For instance, these beads didn't dissolve in here. Those are insoluble, okay? So does that make sense? So everybody, I think, knows what solubility means, but I talk about it a lot, so I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, soluble versus insoluble. And then one more example is freezing point, boiling point, melting point, um, anything about that that you just have to measure. So density, color, shape, size. Um, mass, freezing point, boiling point, all of those things are physical properties, okay? Awesome. A chemical property is a substance's potential to undergo a chemical change. 
good. A substance's potential to undergo a chemical change. So if something says, hey, it can react with hydrochloric acid or it can react with oxygen or it can react with, I don't know, zinc oxide. If you see the word react, that's going to tell you it's a chemical change. The pH of something is a chemical property. The fact that will burn or not, hopefully you know that the word flammable means that it's going to burn. So basically, if you have to do something to it chemically in order to see if that property is going to happen, that is a chemical property. Awesome. Good. So these are some nice, easy physical and chemical properties. You will see these on your quiz on Friday because I just wrote it. So I know. All right. Let's talk about chemical and physical changes, shall we? In a physical change, substances do not change their chemical identity. So whatever chemical it was at the beginning of the change, it is exactly the same at the end of the change. Substances do not change their chemical identity. Another way to say that is that no new substances are formed. Nothing new is formed. So I have a piece of paper up here. What is something I can do to this to make it go through a physical change? You get to rip it. You just crumple it. Okay. Is this now not paper? It's still paper. Here, here. So I like to do that first because the next thing people are like, well, good luck putting that back together. They are usually reversible. Usually. I get that I have a hard time putting this paper back together as it was. But if it's not reversible, take a look and see if did I change it. It's like a, a bird now. I mean, it, it didn't change what it is. It's still paper. So that's physical. Okay. So some examples are like I just did ripping. Oh, two huge hard ones that people usually have a hard time with. And that a lot, this is, I'm guaranteeing you these are on the quiz too, because people think that both of these, for some reason, they like to call them chemical changes and they're not. And if you're looking at some form of state test or anything like that, you can guarantee you're going to see this kind of thing. State changes, I mean, boiling, freezing, melting, condensing. Sometimes people want to say, oh, that must be a chemical change because it went away. But if you think about it, when water is boiling, it is H2O, correct? Yep. Awesome. When it boils into the air, what is it in the air? H2O. Okay. If you freeze it into an ice cube, what is it? H2O. Did you change what it is chemically by boiling it, freezing it, melting it? Uh -uh, none of that stuff. So if I were you, I would put a box around this one because you know I'm going to put something like that on the quiz. Because that's a tricky one that people usually get caught up on. And the other one that people usually get caught up on is what we just did up here. Okay dissolving people want to say well that must be a chemical change because that went away i have a question if i have salt and water in here can i get the salt back yes how yeah. it's good no you can you're right any idea how well we did it last year you did it yeah. if you put a heating substance under this what's that going to do to the water the water is going to boil away and the salt's going to stay behind so remember Physical changes can be undone. Boop. Dissolving is a huge one that I will also put on the quiz because a lot of people say, look, it's gone. Must have been a chemical change. No. You can get it back. It is still salt in there. It is just dissolved in the water. Okay? So those are two very tricky ones. Talk to me. Oh, never mind. We're about to go over there. Oh. Be like, what is we got you. I love that you're looking for that. So anyway, so that's physical changes. Okay? All right, let's hit up some chemical changes then for me. When you do a chemical change, okay, you actually become, make a new substance. You take what you have, you change it at a molecular level. So you rearrange atoms. You actually have to do something to change what that is. 
And for the most part, chemical changes are not reversible. Okay, you can't undo that, if you will. Awesome. Okay, I have a piece of paper here. We're going to talk about evidence of chemical change. What's one thing I can do to this piece of paper to make it undergo a chemical change? Burn it. Burn, well, burn it. All right. So if I have an igniter here, this is paper beforehand, correct? Yeah. And if I light this on fire, ash. is it you got ash? What else comes out of this burning paper, do you think? Got some smoke. What do you see here? We see some light. What do you see? There's the smoke. You get some soot. You get some energy because it's nice and warm. So what we're going to talk about next are pieces of evidence that you see a chemical change is happening. So if you have a gas produced, does this produce gas? You saw the smoke and the soot. Yeah. Very good. Be very careful. Okay. Usually if you see bubbles, and we haven't had our fire drill yet today, so, you know, before anybody comes and asks me what's on fire, let me put that out. Okay, so if you see bubbles or if you see smoke or if you see anything like that, except, and I might underline this, we're not talking boiling because sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, but boiling has bubbles in it. And remember, it's still water, so that's not one of those. If the temperature changes all by itself, I'm not talking about you're like, well, water gets hotter when you boil it. Well, that's because you have it on a heating source. You know, it's not like it's just all of a sudden spontaneously boiling. What I'm talking about is how this produced heat all by itself. All of a sudden, it was like I put a little heat on there, but then it just got hotter and hotter and hotter by itself. Another piece of evidence is that if a substance disappears, do I have the same amount of paper I had at the beginning? I don't. It went away. Another, I feel like every single evidence, I'm like, but, okay, don't think, except dissolving, right? It looks like it disappears in dissolving. If you have a solid formed, and here's another chemistry term we're going to hit real fast. In chemistry, and again, we're not talking about, we're not talking about, um, we're not talking about freezing. I want to get rid of this here. You're like, but an ice cube. In chemistry, when you pour two, li take two liquids together and you make a solid, it's called a precipitate. We are going to talk about precipitates a lot um, as we kind of go through the year. And I'll, I'll go back to that here. Maybe if we finish. P-R-E-C-I. P-I-T-A-T-E, -E, precipitate. And what that would be is when this solution over here is not going to have anything added to it. You can see it's a clear blue solution. This has copper sulfate in it. They're going to put some sodium hydroxide in this. And it's when, when I say solid, sometimes people are like, well, that doesn't look like a, a, a rock. When you add these two things together, you're going to slow-mo. See, they're going to add another solution to this. And then you're going to start to see a blue solid formed. And you could actually filter that out. That is a solid. It's just swimming in the solution a little bit. If you ever see a solid okay, come out of a solution just because you mix two together, that's called a precipitate. And that is absolutely a chemical change. And we'll make some of these later in the year. Okay, perfect. So precipitate. The other thing is if a color change occurs. So if you have your bananas sitting on your countertop, and they brown. Can you get the the fresh banana back? I know. Does it probably smell? I guess. And it's brown. It's a color change. That is a what kind of change with your browning banana? It's a chemical change. Okay. And then if you have a new odor produced. So again, going back to my burning paper, even through your mask, you probably are getting the slight odor of some burning paper. Okay. So if you look at the change I'm giving you, and you see any of these things, chemical change, okay? Awesome, good stuff, good stuff. Oh, we're gonna skip that part, going on to the next part. These are the terms now that are brand new. So if you were like, you put me to sleep because I already know that stuff, come back to me now. 
Intensive and extensive properties are something that they add in the standards at the chemistry level. An intensive property does not depend on the amount of material that you have. Does not depend on the amount of material that you have. One of the most important, you can highlight it, underline it, bold it, because you know I'm going to ask it to you because we already talked about this. Density is intensive for sure. Okay. I don't care if you have a, a liter of water, you fill up this room with water, you fill up the school with water, the density of water is always 1.0 grams per milliliter. Always. Okay. Perfect. I have a question. Yes, talk to me. So why does it get so pressurized if it's like going so when it's so deep, why does water get pressurized? Yes, that great question. So like if you're talking about you try to swim down the bottom of the yeah. pool and hurt your ears, mm -hmm. right? That is simply because of the weight. Like if I put you in a bunch of like ping pong balls, if I literally put you under miles of them, they would eventually push down and because, you know, water can go into your ear and push on you a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But if I stacked up hundreds of thousands of ping pong balls, even though they're really light, that enough mass was on you, you would feel that. So it's not necessarily the density is different. Great, I love the thinking here. It's not that the density is different, it's just you have more on you. So I love that idea. You're talking about an extensive property, which does depend, and that would be something like mass. So it's the mass of how much water that's on you, but if I looked at this volume of water versus this mass, because this is a uh, mass, over volume. This is always a ratio, so it's always going to be one. So the density is the same. You just have a whole lot more mass of it and a whole lot more volume of it on you when you're down deep as opposed to the kiddie pool. We have like a foot on you. That's it's still the density is one, but it's not very massive. Way down low, you have square feet on top of square feet on you, right? Good question. Nice. All right. So the other portion that we did here, I have a bunch of examples and good conversations and stuff like that. We are actually going to do that tomorrow for our um, like little talking portion and our interactive part tomorrow. What I want everybody to do right now, I think we have like 10 minutes. we got 10 minutes. I do want you to do your lecture questions for this one. So go into Tuesday. I want to make sure I like I cut this all down so I wouldn't forget this time. So now go into Tuesday. And in Tuesday, there are three more lecture questions. I want to make sure you get that. And I want to see and grab some attendance of my at-home peeps. Make sure everybody's doing good. This should have been a very straightforward, good lecture, easy stuff to study. Hopefully, we're feeling swell. All right, all right. Put the jams on collide. So you need both Tuesday and Monday done by the time you leave today.